Hello and welcome back to TIFU. We have stories that is as great as the time that I passed gas so loud in a store it echoed, causing 10 people to stare at me, and the possibility of cringy stories that would make you cry with embarrassment, like the time I was giving a speech in front of 100 people with my fly down, at the same time as making the poor choice of going commando. If that didn't do it for you, then maybe these will. Buckle up, because here we go. The following is the most humiliated I've ever been in my life. I've been born and raised in a small mountain town in California, the kind of town where everybody knows everybody and the community is pretty involved. This town only had one high school that the community supported regularly because everybody had gone to that school. My music teacher actually taught my stepdad while he was in high school. I was a freshman in high school and I was the lead trumpet in this school's concert band and also jazz band. It was a fairly regular thing for the music program to put on performances for the town. And considering the size of the town, it was a pretty good turnout. About halfway through the year, we put on a concert for the town's performing arts center, joined by the high school's choir. Easily one of the biggest buildings in town, it seated like 400 people. We were handed a schedule showing the order of each group that would be performing. This performing arts center had a rotating stage on which they set up the concert band on one side with the choir on the other with the wall dividing the two setting up the jazz band down in front of the stage. The night of the performance was advertised throughout the town. The high school was using it as an event to show off its musical program. So when that ill-fated night arrived, the building was packed out with everyone I've ever known or met. The concert band performed first. We played two songs and stayed still as the stage rotated for what I thought was to reveal the choir for their performance. Chatting with a few friends from the concert band, we stayed backstage. A few minutes had passed past when I started to get this nagging feeling that something wasn't right. I noticed two things right away. There was absolutely no sound coming from the stage. In the dimly lit backstage area, I realized the choir was also standing around me chatting. These two realizations hit me like a bolt of lightning. I grabbed my trumpet and ran around to the side door. That led to the front stage where the jazz band was set up. As stealthily as I could, I cracked the door open and poked my head out to see if I could sneak into place in the jazz band. Instead, to my horror, my head was immediately illuminated with a spotlight. My band instructor, who was halfway to the door on his way to come find me, stopped and faced the crowded audience with a flourish pointed at me and announced, there he is! This was met with laughter. Still illuminated by the spotlight, I had to shamefully walk from the side door to my place, witnessed by the entire hometown. This was devastatingly embarrassing for a 14-year-old kid. I will forever hold this story as my most humiliating moment. I used to work at a pizzeria, and Sundays were usually my day to open from 11 o'clock a.m. and I work by myself until 4 p.m. So it's Sunday morning and after Saturday night, I am not the most alert person. Luckily, opening up is a standard routine and it doesn't take much brain activity. But this morning, I didn't even have the minimum I should have. Like always, the first thing I do is turn the oven on to 550 degrees. Second thing, heat up some tomato sauce, meatballs, sausages, and whatever soups are left from the night before. They get put in these big metal pots with thick metal handles and are heated over these gas burners that the fire comes out so hot that it's blue in color. There's only two burners, so I heat only two pots at a time. So the first two get to just about boiling point and are ready to transfer to the steam table. I do so using very thick pot holders so that I can grab the metal pot handles. I repeat this until everything is heated up and transferred. Then I put the pots on a nearby table to cool down. I go fill up the ice unit for the ice machine. Then I go chop lettuce and tomatoes, fill the mayonnaise bottles, prepping the sandwich area. That way all the pots can cool down. Again, 
this is normal routine for me so far. Usually my next step is taking the cooled down pots over to the sink and wash them out. I don't know what happened this Sunday. Either I had the burners hotter than normal. I must have been a lot faster than usual. Cause when I grabbed the first pot, I made the ill-fated decision to not use pot holders. They're usually cooled down enough to handle with bare hands, but I burnt the heck out of my hand. I threw the pot back on the table. I cursed myself, the pot, and my lot in life in general. As I looked at my bright red hands, the pain was making it start to throb. I knew I needed to get some ice for my hand. However, the ice unit was in a completely opposite direction of the sink. So I think to myself, drop the pots off in the sink so it could be taken care of later then go get some ice for my hand and take a break for a few minutes. I inwardly nod to myself that this is the best course of action. So I grab the pots again, this time with my other hand. And no pot holder. I burnt the heck out of my other hand. I spent the rest of the day at work nursing my handle burnt hands and calling myself an idiot. First, I want to say that I was born in Michigan, which this may play a part in my story later. I have lived my entire life here. Anyone that's been to the cities of Michigan, which I was raised in the Detroit area, knows that the state is flat on a grid compared to like, oh, let's say California. In 2015, my husband and I lived in Sonora, California. It's a small town that rests in the mountains. This one night, he and I decided to go bar hopping. In Sonora, the small town strip is nothing but bars. Small hole-in-the-wall bars. After about 10 hours of drinking and going from place to place, we decided that it was enough for the night. By then, it's around 11 p.m., whereby we start heading home. Since we were drinking, and we only live three blocks away, we decided to leave our car in the parking lot and walk home, just to be safe. We start walking, and I'm feeling invincible, like nothing can stop me or break me, not even the cement. I turn to him and say, I think I'll skip home. My husband in turn says, No, that's not a good idea. But before he can finish his sentence, I start skipping down the hill, which at the time I didn't realize was downhill. Of course, as I'm skipping downhill, I have been wearing sandals, and I suddenly begin to skip faster, beyond my own control. I end up skipping through the street, down an empty car lot, through a grocery store parking lot, where I finally trip over my own feet and crash Mac right into the pavement, face first. Now at this time, I was basically knocked out. My husband had to inform me of the rest of the details. He said that he casually strolled down the street, which is downhill, mind you, just moseying along. He notices me lying in the middle of the grocery store parking lot with a pickup truck stopped in front of me. He instantly thinks that I was hit by a car. He yells at the driver, and they said they stopped because they see me laying there in the parking lot all sprawled out. He tells them that he will take care of it, and then he said I woke up. Now, from what I remembered next, I got up, literally dusted myself off, wiped the blood off my face, and tried to continue to skip to our apartment, which was across the street from the grocery store, by the way. My husband tried to stop me, but I guess I just kept going. I remember waking up in the morning with this intense headache. I headed to the bathroom, and going to the bathroom mirror, realizing half of my front tooth was chipped off and my face had road rash. Plus, I had this huge bruise on my forehead. I screamed in fright. Because I'm not an ugly woman, I take care of myself. So this was just like WTF, which I proceeded to say out loud. I instantly said out loud, I look like a pumpkin head! Fast forward a little bit later. My husband took me to the local hospital. I was in the waiting room and some lady said, Oh, let me guess. She hurt herself roller skating. I turned and looked at the woman with as much glare as I could, and I said, No, I'm from Michigan, where it's flat. Where I'm from, I can skip home drunk. That shut her up, and here I am learning a lifelong lesson of what not to do next time I'm in California, in the mountains. We still laugh about it today. Here's a little backstory to explain why certain events occurred. At the time this happened, we lived in Colorado. This fact will come into play, trust me. We also had a rather old refrigerator. I was also about six, 
and my older brother was around eight. Yeah, that's awfully young to remember this story, but this is one of the many stories my mom and I retell. Anyways, to the story. It was a rather hot summer in Colorado. That being said, we had no AC. Since hot summer days are not very often, the remedy to not having an AC? My brother and I often munched on ice. My parents would buy these in big bags and place it in the freezer section of our fridge. On this day, our mom was busy cleaning and we weren't really underfoot so that she could clean without being interrupted. She had just finished cleaning the kitchen and moved to the tiny hall bathroom. Just as my brother came in from playing outside, he passed my mom on the way to the kitchen. She told him not to make a miss. Since the kitchen was spotless at the moment, he said that he was just getting some ice. He proceeded to the kitchen and to the freezer door, which he opened to find that there was no ice whatsoever. He still wanted ice, however, and he didn't want to have to wait. After a moment, he got this bright idea of sticking his entire tongue on the freezer door. Side note, neither of us have seen or even heard of a Christmas story at this time. Therefore, we didn't know the scene where the kid got his tongue stuck on a metal pole until much, much later. Anyways, he then panicked. He was stuck. That was pretty clear. Instead of trying to yell for help, he decided to do something far worse. He already made one bad decision. Might as well go for two. He proceeded to yank his tongue off the freezer door. Almost instantly, his tongue started to bleed and he panicked even more. He rushed to my mom, who at the time hadn't heard anything because she was listening to music. My brother burst into the tiny hall bathroom, which gave my mom a scare. She asked what happened as she tried to wash his hands because there was so much blood on his hands, it appeared that he hurt his hand somehow. Of course, my brother was grunting and making various sounds other than words. Our mom had it and she proceeded to say, I don't know what's wrong. Show me what happened. He took her by the hand and led her out of the bathroom. She was also greeted by a trail of blood on our clean floors. He proceeded to lead her to the fridge, which had a good amount of blood near it, and opened the freezer door to find the top layer of his tongue still attached. Mom then went into panic mode and called the neighbors asking for ice. Our neighbors down the street brought some ice, but it wasn't doing any good. My mom had her neighbors watch me as she packed up my brother and took him to the ER. The ER helped to get the bleeding to stop and gave my brother some antibiotics to make sure he didn't get ill from doing something this stupid. He recovered from this experience with no damage done. The tongue is surprisingly resilient. However, the bed of tongue on the freezer door remained there until we moved three years later. Last year, I was a freshman in college. I took general ed psychology, and as a part of the class, he had volunteered to participate in a certain number of research studies. Usually, they were pretty boring tasks that you had to do on the computer, and the one on this fateful day proved to be no different. After I arrived, the cheerful research lady explained what I was supposed to do and led me to a small testing room. The first part was just me alone at the computer doing some monotonous activity. I think I had to press a button whenever I saw a certain number pop up on the screen or something like that. When I completed the first section, the computer instructed me to go find a researcher and I got up and found her in the hallway and she told me while I work on the second part of the test, she was going to be sitting at another table in the testing room and do some paperwork. I said okay, and I really didn't think about it. She sat down and faced away from me. While I returned to the computer and started the second part of the test, man, it was boring. The minutes stretched so far. They seemed endless. The computer didn't even show the time, so I couldn't even watch them painfully tick by. I just sat there, eyes glued to the screen, occasionally tapping the button when the number came up. It was easy. Eh, too easy. What was this even supposed to be testing? If I was alive? To make matters worse, it was early in the morning and the room was really dark for some reason. My eyelids got extremely heavy and I struggled not to start a yawn marathon. I could feel tumbleweeds drifting around in my brain. So I decided to do a little cheer exercises that would help me perk up. Still robotically pressing buttons on the keyboard, I stretched my back and set up as straight as I could. Then I did this thing where I squeezed one butt cheek at a time. Hey, they're pretty effective as a last resort. And it worked. I started waking up a little. So I continued. Up, up, down, down, 
Sometimes one cheek at a time, sometimes both. I happily squished up and down in my seat, focused on the screen. Then I rocked in a circle a bit. The circles progressively widened until I swayed from one side of the chair to the other, ceiling fan style. At this point, I was swinging myself around, still going up and down like an idiotic fishing bobber, probably looking unbelievably stupid. I didn't care as long as it helped me stay awake and focus on the never-ending button pushing. Finally, the test was over. I turned around to tell the researcher, who was coincidentally already getting up. She left the room so I could complete the last part of the test, a survey. She explained that it would ask me about my experience being part of the research project and let me know what the project was about. I said okay, relieved that I was almost done. I sat down, clicked the start button to read the first question. During the task, did you know you were being watched? This made me pause. What do you mean watched? Then I remembered the researcher, how she randomly decided to get some paperwork done in a dark room. How did she know that I was done with my test before I told her? She must have waited until I faced the computer screen, then turned towards me and took notes on my behavior, while I thought the research was to see what amount of boring you could survive. I learned that it actually was to observe the participants' behavior patterns during a long, repetitive activity. And mine were all carefully documented on her clipboard. A laughing fit quickly <laughs> overpowered my embarrassment, knowing that a grad student student was going to have to include some weirdo participant's butt cheek squeezing in her official research findings. Thank you very much for joining me. If you want to be a Patreon, there should be a link in the description. One dollar a month, you'll be able to get an audio file to download to listen to anytime you want. And I'm going to start giving special shout outs to every one of my Patreons until I go through the list. Every single episode. Oh, those mistakes in the beginning, they're all real. And they happen to me. If you have any mistakes you want to share, just send them to me. You won't be outed like I did myself. I'm going to be hosting a contest soon once I hit 40,000 subscribers. The winner will receive a $50 gift card to Amazon. And once I hit 50,000, I'm going to double that number. I hope you like, subscribe, and share this video with others so I can reach that number as quick as possible. I hope to see you again for the next episode. So until next time, have fun with your failures, or they'll have fun with you.